Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Donna Stewart, and I'm a member of Take Part, the Portland Anti-Racism Team. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We are so excited to have Michelle Lewis with us this evening. Uh, before I turn things over to her, I'm going to go through just a couple of housekeeping things. And I have a few slides. All right. Okay. Play. See, this is the problem that I had, Marianne. Oh, there we go. Play. Can I? There we go. There it is. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Donna Stewart, and I'm a member of Take Part, the Portland Anti Racism Team. Um, we are so excited to have everybody at the event this evening. And before I turn it over to Ms. Michelle Lewis, I have just a few housekeeping things to go over. The mission of Take Part is to confront racism and to engage in dismantling the systems that perpetuate ingrained racial inequality. We do this through events, education, and outreach that foster engagement in building a community where all people are treated with equality and respect. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the presentation uh, in the presentation of Take Part events are those of the individuals. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Take Part or its members. Take Part affirms that the Portland area is the rightful homeland of the Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook peoples, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and the many other native people who live here, have always lived here, and who have always belonged to and cared for this land. This event is made possible in part by the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Portland and by the contributions of individual donors like you. We work in partnership with the Association for Human Advancement and Development. We have a few communication agreements that we like to use in our meetings. The first is to listen, listen more and listen even when you're feeling uncomfortable. Oh. Engage tension and do not indulge drama. The acronym WAIT, why am I talking? And engage in consultation and collaboration, not competition. We try to maintain a safe space for difficult, difficult conversations. So you can take away the lessons learned and the insights gained, but leave behind who said what. We're gonna ask attendees to remain muted until the Q&A portion, which is gonna be after the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, you can use the chat button and uh, put your question in the chat box. During the Q&A, you can use the reaction button at the bottom of your screen and use the raise hand feature. Uh, when you're called on, it says, the, the slide says the host will unmute you, but you will also have the opportunity to unmute yourself. So we ask that if you're not actively asking a question, that you please remain muted because the random sounds that come are very distracting for everyone. And also please keep your comments and questions concise and respectful. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Victoria, who will be introducing our, our speaker this evening. I don't think we can hear you, Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Can you there hear me you now? Go. Yeah. Okay. I just okay. realized that I was probably muted. Um, so, hey, everybody. Um, I'm so, so excited to introduce Michelle Lewis. I've had an opportunity to spend some time with her, and I think that you're going to be in for a real treat this evening. Um, she... Uh, Michelle is going to be talking about um, recognizing and confronting implicit bias, both in ourselves and in others. And um, she is the co-owner with her husband, Charles, of the Third Eye Books, Accessories and Gifts, which is in Portland. It's right off of 33rd and Division. Um, and actually, it's on 33rd, right off of Division. And it's an amazing store. It's the only Black-owned bookstore in Oregon. Um, Michelle also has an MSW from Portland State University and um, more than 15 years of experience 
in the human resources and mental health fields. She is also a Reiki master, sacred woman practitioner, and vibrational sound therapist. Michelle has been married for 27 years, is the mother of three sons, and a grandmother to three, almost four, beautiful grandchildren. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome, have you welcome Michelle Lewis. Thank you. Thank you so much. We give thanks and praises for the most high, first and foremost, for having me here. I thank everyone for inviting me. And um, before I get started, um, I just would like, you know, I want to ask my elder Brenda if, if it's if I have your permission to continue forward, please. You have my permission. Give yeah, thanks. So um, I was just sharing with uh, my friend Victoria and the rest of you that, you know, um, I wanted this to be, you know, just be open and, and, and engage in just really organic conversation. I do have some slides that I am going to read from. I'm going to tell you because I can't keep all this in my, in my head. So, um, and, and it's a very important information, but then I'm just going to be speaking from my my perspective of how I navigate this world as an African woman. I identify myself as an African woman. I always let people know that my geopolitical location is here in the United States, but I am African. I am Nigerian. I've traced my lineage. Um, it made perfect sense once I got my DNA back. Because I've always loved watching African movies and dancing. And so it, it didn't surprise me when that um, came up. So um, um, after I'm done with the slides, you know, like I said, I'm going to be speaking from my perspective. And I go back, I don't speak for all Black folk. And I know sometimes that happens when folks ask uh, Black folks to come and speak. People sometimes think that we're the voice of everyone. Nope, I'm speaking for Michelle Lewis and how Michelle Lewis experiences and moves about in this world. Um, and that's the perspective I'll be uh, speaking from. So with that being said, I'll go ahead. Uh, like I said, we're gonna be talking about how to recognize and confront implicit bias. And I'll have you go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, as I said before, thank you guys for having me. And I just want to also put out a gentle reminder to pay attention as a sound therapist and as a mental health therapist, that is my professional background before I did um, opened up my bookstore. I practiced for um, a little over 10 years in the mental health field. I'm an Afrocentric mental health practitioner. So I predominantly seen um, black and brown indigenous people of color who are specifically looking to work with a black woman or a person of color. And um, so I will let you know, you know, to pay attention to how you feel in your body. Um, this can be a very uncomfortable conversation. And I'm saying, sharing this with you all from a place of love that if you become uncomfortable um, because of what you hear me sharing, with you, please take the time to kind of check in with yourself and ask yourself why you're uncomfortable before you become upset if you choose to go that route. And because that can happen, you know, it's, it, you know, blame me is because looking at me ain't easy. That's the acronym. And um, sometimes it's easier to be angry with someone than to stop and slow down because we may be triggered, we may be operating. And the reptilian part of our brain, which is right here in the base, we refer to it as the atlas versus the prefrontal cortex, which is our executive reasoning and function. So when we get triggered, we're going to go right to that reptilian brain, food, clothing, shelter, safety. And, I'm, and most often, if, it's, if I'm feeling unsafe or uncomfortable, that's probably where I'm going to operate from. So please take care of your body. Take care of yourself. Walk away. Take a break. And, um, and then return. Um, if you choose to do so, which I hope you do. Uh, we're going to talk about what is implicit bias and how to recognize it. And then I'm going to provide some examples of that. Give thanks. Next slide. So um, if you can scroll up just a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. There, there you go. So implicit bias versus bias, what is it? Because there's definitely a difference. And I thought I, it would be best to just put up a definition um, 
of uh, those two differences. So with implicit bias are really pretty much the thoughts and thoughts and feelings are implicit. So um, if we are unaware of them or mistaken about their nature, um, we have biases when rather than being neutral, we have a preference for or an aversion to a person or a group of people. Thus, we use the term implicit bias to describe when we have attitudes towards people or associate stereotypes with them without conscious knowledge. So we're not aware of it. A fairly common example of that that I put here is that uh, studies that show that white people will frequently associate criminality with black people without even realizing that they're doing it. So another example could be in most black folks that can bring it up or I brought it up where you can be on an elevator and it could be with a white woman and she clutches her purse. The person, you know, you know, I and I've seen it's happened with me in the elevator. Um, and so um just inherently just thinking that if by me being in a small space with someone that is that is black, that's something that they're gonna rob me or do something harmful to me. Explicit bias conversely refers to positive or negative attitudes that we are fully aware of. Um, these are things that we openly probably talk about with other people. We share them with others because these attitudes are part of our worldview. Despite their differences, implicit bias can be just as problematic as explicit bias because both may lead to discriminatory behavior. So those are the two differences that I wanted to make sure that we had an idea of what they were and how different they are. And that at the end of the day, they both are problematic. Next slide. So I put in here why it matters. Um, like I say, mind sciences have found that most of our actions occur without our conscious thoughts allowing us to function in an extraordinarily complex world. This means, however, that our implicit biases often predict how we're gonna behave more accurately than our conscious values. So many, there are many studies out there that you can look at that I also found that those people with higher implicit bias levels against black people are more likely to categorize non-weapons as weapons such as, and we, we are seeing this even right, what we're talking about, what's happening in the world right now, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but a phone, seeing someone with a phone as a for a gun or a comb for a knife, and in computer simulations are more likely to shoot an unarmed person. Similarly, white physicians who implicitly associate Black patients with being less cooperative um, drug addicts were less likely to refer Black patients with pain and or serious health conditions for specific medical care. We're seeing that, and we talk about those type of disparities all the time in the medical field. Um, I've experienced them myself going in for pain, and we, I understand that there's a history that Black folks don't feel pain. You know, we have no souls, um, things of that nature that's in the fabric and it's and it's kind of trickled down throughout history. So when I'm going to go seek care for, you know, pain, I have been asked to sign contracts by doctors um, for uh, pain medication for something as, as, you know, 10 milligrams of Vicodin just for pain and me being having to sign, uh, being asked, and of course I respectfully decline to sign a contract um, because there is uh, there's this perception that I might be drug seeking when I have no knowledge, no history of uh, drug uh, addictions in my file, but yet I get treated like that. Next slide. So one way to ex how to expose and recognize implicit bias um, is to um, look at the counter stereotypes and focus on the unique individuals that we interact with. Similarity bias is, uh, is the tendency to favor ourselves and those like us. When our brains label someone as being with, uh, within our same group, we tend to empathize better and use our actions and words and body language to signal those ways that we relate to them. So two ways that I, you know, that I want to you know, spend a little time on is perspective taking. 
So um, when I would teach my students about biases, I'm always like, you know, to really look at the perspective. Like this tactic involves taking the first person perspective of a member of a stereotype group, which can increase the psychological closeness to that group. So one way, like, like what you guys are doing now, you're, you're being part of this group, you're part of this discussion. That's one way to, you know, to take in a different perspective reading novels, watching documentaries, listening to podcasts that are accessible ways to reach beyond our comfort zone. So watching things, reading books that don't keep you in a space of comfort, to read history where they may call out the behaviors of Eurasian people throughout history. And even to hear it from someone like me to say, from my perspective, as an African woman, as a person who is part as, as, as Black, that we understand, we know that we have been labeled systematically, ongoing, continuously as being inherently criminal in this country. Even though historically, when you look at the history of Eurasian people throughout the world, it is written by even by other white people that there has not been a place that Eurasian people have not went to where they have not brought destruction and death and genocide. You know, they may, you know, terms may be used like plundering and whatever. And, you know, um, what is it? Discovery is, you know, we pick your words are so powerful. We pick and choose how we want to um, talk about history when, you know, Columbus discovered. But if you ask someone from a native you know, uh, community, he didn't discover nothing. And even from an African perspective, he had no, he, he didn't even know where he was going. And but, but yet the word discovery, how it shifts, how people will look at it and receive that information from a historical standpoint, if I'm making sense. The other thing is, um, you know, to authentically perceive another person's persp perspective, however, you should engage in positive interactions with stereotype group members in real life. Increased face-to-face -face contact with people who seem different from you on the surface undermines implicit bias. So having a Black friend does not make you impervious to racism. Just because you know a Black friend, because you can know a Black person and never spend not one moment, day, or time around them, but still uh, be very biased and act out in such ways that um, reinforce microaggressions and things of that nature. The other perspective is to slow down, to recognize when you're being biased. Sometimes as a therapist, I always used to remind, sometimes saying things out loud, you know, or just, you know, acknowledging and hear, having to, to hear yourself say that, wow, I'm being biased. I'm biased right now. And then for a moment, taking that moment to see how that settles in your body. Where does that feeling land at? Is it in your gut? Is it in your shoulders? Is it in your back? To really sit with that and allow yourself to experience what it is that you're feeling. Pause and think. So for example, the next time you interact with someone in a stereotype group or observe societal stereotyping, such as through the media, recognize where responses are based on stereotypes. When you're, because TV is very powerful. It is a uh, tell I with the, here is tell lie vision, L-I-E, tell I vision is lying. And so when you see some simple things like commercials, um, to not look at things as being entertainment, but to see how certain groups are depicted in movies and in commercials and, and, um, and, and just, unpack it and see how that stereotype impacts a group of people and how it impacts you and it informs how you're going to interact with that specific group that is being stereotyped. Labels and reflect on why those responses occurred. You might even consider how the biased response could be avoided in the future and then replace it with an unbiased response. That could be dependent on if it's somebody that you know and you understand that there's some biases that came up in your interaction with them. Maybe you're able to sit down and talk to that person 
And sometimes you can figure out, you know, if you're how close proximity you are to them in, in terms of your relationship, ask them, you know, hey, this came up for me. How, you know, what can I do differently? You know, um, checking in. And sometimes people will be very honest with giving you some feedback um, so that you can be able to make um, changes around that and to do better. All right, next slide. So um, there, this is a book that just recently um, was released. It's called Living While Black, Portraits of Everyday Resistance. And I um, want to share this book with you all because it's a gra like a graphic novel. It's easy to share with your um, with young, young kids as well as with teens and even as adults because it gets straight to the point and it gives various examples of racial bias and things that Black folks have to deal with on a regular daily basis. And um, so I put up here, studies have shown that hiring managers who review resumes are more likely to skip those with African-American sounding names on them. So that's a pretty prevalent ongoing bias today. I think I, I was sharing with Victoria and um, that, you know, my children all have African names with the exception of one, um, my oldest son. Um, but um, my, my middle son is Kahari Malik Jamal. And then my youngest is Kalanji Kamu Anase Hannah. And they had name in, African naming ceremonies. And I remember being very um, reticent about having them having African names um, because I did think about how they might be treated, um, looking for work, um, things of that nature. And so I remember sharing, my husband was very clear with me that he did not want his children to have slave names. He, he was just very clear when, when we met. And, um, and he wanted, like I say, be, you know, have an African naming ceremony and for their names to have meaning. And, um, are, you know, that that the names that are given to you from an African perspective often determine your path in life. And so even as an African, when they give names, it's, it's very intentional and it's thought out. And there's reason there's reasons behind that, why that name is given, depending on, you know, various tribes and um, and things of that nature. So um, aging while Black, um, a reference to any act of police violence against medically vulnerable, chronically ill, or disabled Black persons over the age of 60, a phrase applied to encounters in which police officers, officers display any open disregard for the dignity, health, or safety of Black elders. Um, banking while Black, a reference to Black banking customers experience a refusal of service, denial of access to funds, or excessive requests for identification. Two, a reference to the arrest and de uh, detainment of Black banking customers for attempting to complete lawful financial transactions like everybody else does every day. Um, me and my husband just experienced this with a bank, just experienced it. I've experienced it on multiple occasions, but just within the last week, we had to deal with um, banking while Black. Um, delivery while Black, we're seeing these things even in social media, now that people can go live, where um, Black folks can't even gain entrance to their homes or their buildings, even to deliver food while they're working um, without being accosted by a, you know, the, the ones I've seen most often are by white women accosting um, people saying, hey, you know, you don't live here. You know, what's your code to get in the building? And this person's like, I'm here to deliver food. And and they're just, you know, being typical individuals. They ain't got much to do, but they want to be uh, harassed and um, malign uh, Black folk. And then with that being said, there that's the biases that is being played out that this woman or this individual doesn't even know who this person is, but for one, for reason, they've made it their business to police and interrogate and monitor and watch this black person 
try to make a living or try to do their job and they interrupt it or try to be a problem as much as possible. And the first thing is I'm going to call the police on you. And, you know, we know what happens when the police is weaponized. Usually somebody black comes up dead. Then I have listed down here, if you can scroll up just a little bit more, they're shopping while black, constantly driving while black and going home while black. That So I list those things just to give you some very clear examples of racial bias that we are seeing here. It, this hasn't went away. It's even ramped up even more during these political times. And we're seeing it right now with just the young brother who is 16, who went to go um, pick up, you know, his younger siblings. And he went, he was one block over from where his uh, siblings were at, and he rang the doorbell of an older white man who came out, who shot the child, shot him, and then came outside and shot him again. And you're like, wow, this baby, he, this, this child, he's 16, shot for ringing the doorbell and going to the to to the wrong house. And the messaging that I'm already seeing that's already being put out there is they're looking at this young man's size. And I'm like, what does his size have to do with it? Then he said he, the young brother was trying to wiggle his doorknob. First it was, he rung his doorbell. Then he was, you know, messing with his doorknob. Then he said, I was scared to death that he was going to rob me. Well, we can, I guess we can all agree or maybe respectfully agree to disagree that when somebody coming to rob you, they definitely ain't going to ring your doorbell and they definitely ain't going to knock on your door. But yet you have a 16 year old young black man whose life is forever changed and who will be dealing with trauma for a good part of his life is being shot. I've never been shot, but I've seen and been around, unfortunately, people who have, um, that changes your life forever. So we got that this current example of a racial bias that has caused harm to a young black child and his whole entire family and community. All right, next slide. So what is the Harvard Implicit Bias Association test? This is a test that measures the strength and association between concepts or stereotypes that reveal an individual's implicit or subconscious biases. So when you click on this link, and I know that um, everybody who wants a copy of this will be sent a copy where you can click on this link right here and it will bring up not only the standard implicit, the IET, but many other tests that you can take to assess your biases. So the LGBTQ um, um, folks, if you have issues or biases with folks who are not able-bodied, elders, things of that nature. So there's plenty of tests on here that you can take and or familiarize yourself with so that you can get an idea of your blind spots and areas that you need to work on. This is a link that I, that I would share when I would teach my classes quite a bit um, that I would encourage my students to, I would pick a certain test that I would want them to take and then we would process it, talk about it as a group. So um, this is definitely one that I would encourage you guys to take a gander at when you have an opportunity. There's pl lots of information there about the IET test. All right, next. Um, so these are some strategies that you can implement. I have went through two of them already. Remember earlier in my, um, when I started talking, I talked about introspective, um, perspective taking, and um, also uh, uh, taking the time to, uh, to slow down. So here are some other ones. I gave a description of introspection, and then a resource that you can utilize um, uh, to do further learning on as well. So what I listed here was mindfulness, 
um, practice ways to reduce your stress and increase mindfulness, such as meditation, yoga, focused breathing, prayer, um, things of that nature. Sometimes being quiet. We are in a society today where, with you know, it's hard for people to sit with oneself and quiet because we're constantly bombarded with, you know, all different um, external stimuli, things outside. Um, our thoughts, are, you know, you know, some people say my thoughts just never turn off. They're racing constantly. And one way to quiet the mind is to begin practicing in incremental small amounts of the time of just sitting in quiet. You will get distracted. Honor that. Don't judge it. And then come right back to it. So mindfulness is great. We talked about perspective taking, learning how to slow down, pause and reflect on your potential biases before interacting with people of certain groups to reduce reflexive reactions and also to reduce you getting hurt. I'm gonna just be really clear and upfront. I think we're, we have a whole new generation of people and I'm included in it that I think for some, even for some POC, I'm included because I don't, uh, I, you know, um, we get all these term terms now, BIPOC, POC, and for a long time, Black folks and POC all lumped together, but we still haven't really talked about really a lot about the anti-Blackness, even within POC people and, and Black folk. And, you know, and that's an uncomfortable conversation. So there's biases that play out with that. But we're dealing, I'm going back to a different generation where you cannot just talk to people any kind of way or um, and not expect someone to respond or I call it matching your energy, whatever that might be. And so it's been really interesting to see that in certain interactions, when you see these things playing out on live on social media and you see somebody in a store and a woman, it, you know, going back to a white woman interacting in inappropriate ways with somebody black. And that Black person is not having it under any circumstances. And so when we respond and match energy, then once again, here is that bias. Um, you're a criminal, you're crazy, you're there to hurt me, and now I'm the victim, even though you started it. And somebody's like, you started? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish it, whatever that might be. Now, I don't condone violence at all, but... I'm going to just be up front. You know how I was raised. We're not taking no free butt whoopings either. So when we're dealing now with groups of people where there's a different generation out here that's like, no, we're not, we're not in the fifties anymore. We're not, we're not dealing with this. We're not, we don't have to step down off the street and put our head down and walk away. I don't have to allow you to get in my face and start screaming and yelling and putting your hands on me. And then I'm supposed to go a different way. This is a different time now so we have to learn about slowing down and really thinking about just like we teach our children life operates on logical and natural consequences natural we don't have to do anything it just happens but logical sometimes people have to impose it and so I always tell people like hey when you approach someone and you're going to think about doing xyz you need to be ready for whatever consequences comes up as a result of your behavior and own it if you know you stepped out of line with somebody in a store and said something inappropriate and that person responded accordingly, hey, you know, um, you get to make some different choices. Like, I'm going to go ahead and leave this alone and, and move on, or I'm going to go ahead and keep moving and then whatever comes up, comes up. But I just say that we, I'm hearing that a lot from people that, we, you know, this is a different generation. We're not putting up with this stuff. And so I'm just, you know, have to remind people um, of that as well. Um, the other one is check your uh, messaging. Um, sorry, I'm going to X that little box up. Embrace evidence-based statements that reduce implicit bias. Um, institutionalize fairness, promote procedural changes in organizations um, oh, uh -oh, that move. Um, I'm sorry, I, that uh, that move toward a socially accountable healthcare system um, with the goal of health equity. I kept that in there in terms of because at the time in my class we were talking we we were talking about as in terms of mental health. So um, this can be applied. This can be applied to any 
um, institution. You know, if, if we know if you're working like if you're working in an organization that, you know, where equity is is um, invisible or not, you know, you just don't see it or you see something happening, then it may be up to you to be the person that speaks out about it and 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 uh, works alongside somebody to make procedural changes. But also be aware that you may lose some social capital. You know, you made the friend, you may lose some friends for speaking up <clears throat> uh, when you see things are not, are not fair. And then it takes two, cultural humility, practice it. You know, it's, it's a lifelong process, self-reflection, um, readdress the power imbalances um, in your relationships with uh, various communities of color. Sometimes you got to know that white folks are not the standard and, and don't know everything. And even though history has touted and presented as white folks being the all-knowing, the inventors of most things and this, that, but you're not. And so be open to um, having some cultural humility when you're dealing with someone from a different culture that may know more than you and not uh, taking it up on yourself to try to tell them how they should move, think, or feel um, when they respond to certain situations. Um, so next. So I have here just some references um, that I used. Um, that's for you. And I have the couple of books that um, I recommend. These are a few that I've read and used in classes. And then, of course, um, we, we shared a little bit about, we have Sayara Rao and Regina Jackson, from, who wrote a book called White Women, Everything You Already Know About Your Own Racism and How to Do Better. They're going to be here May 5th at the Clinton Street Theater. And so we're going to be talking about instances where, um, in particular, politically what's happening, but with uh, white women and how white women play a huge part in reinforcing a lot, you know, pretty much the nutshell is, is that um, they do talk about um, how white women most often will um, sacrifice or, you know, pretty much set aside, they, they will sacrifice their own gender, like, you know, things that are important to how you move about in this world as a white woman, things that help you thrive and prosper and be well and do well, that you will sacrifice that to uphold white body supremacy, even when it impacts you. And we talked, I shared this with you, we talked, let's use the example Roe versus Wade. You know, I, I was very clear. It did not surprise me when white men came for Roe versus Wade at all. I, it didn't surprise me, not one bit. It just was like, hmm, you know, um, but that there are women who are participating in it, you know, that I get that that might not be what you believe in, in, in terms of abortion or whatever that might be. And that's okay, but for you to say that you, what you feel is best for um, for society because of your beliefs or your religion or whatever is not good for the greater whole. And um, just respecting that people are making decisions of, on their life. And so even with white women, it's like, oh wow, you know, some you know there being there are lots of women who are were in alignment with Roe versus Wade. Be, Roe versus uh, Wade being overturned, and um, and that says a lot, you know. Being, I'm thinking from as a woman about, I have a granddaughter, and how those decisions will impact her, and she doesn't even have a voice, and she's just a child. But those decisions are already being made by other people, and um, without them even taking into consideration um, how she might feel when she becomes an adult woman. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll open it up now. We can, you know, just, you know, uh, hear y'all's thoughts um, on what I've shared so far. And then that'd be great. Yeah. This is Victoria. Wait a second. Let me turn my there. This is Victoria. Would you um, speak a little bit about the um, deconstructing Karen 
uh, documentary and the race to dinner uh, and how that, um, because that's actually what's going to be shown at the Clinton Street Theater, but the authors with from White Women will also be there, right? Is that? Yes, that yes. Right? So would you just speak? Yes, so um, there is a documentary called Deconstructing Care, and it's on Apple TV right now. That's how I saw it. Well, I first saw it because somebody sent me, one of my, uh, our customers sent me a link and said, you should, you know, do you guys got this book and you should watch this? And so I watched YouTube and um, was blown away because really what it is, is there, uh, Sayara and Regina have an organization called Race to Dinner and white women can host a dinner. They pay, they talk about this in the book. They don't make a lot of money, but that's been the topic that's came up that they're making white women feel bad by having them pay money to be come to the to come to a dinner to be called the rate of racist, which is really when you look at the documentary, all those women there are there voluntarily. They were invited by their friend who hosted the dinner and said, hey, come. This is what the topic Because I asked, do these women know? That they come into this dinner? Yes. Then nobody's blindsided. Nobody is a shackle with somebody else to come there. They show up because their friend is hosting this dinner. And really, they get down to it very quickly. They're talking about um, how white women are complicit and dangerous, progressive white women who don't think that they can be racist. And they have other white women who are like, yeah, I'm, I'm one of them. I can at least own it. And I'm trying to do some things to change so that I can be a better person, a better human being, and not continue to perpetuate this foolishness because it's foolish. So um, they come to this dinner and they talk about various topics. One of the things I'm going to tell you that got me was when Regina is the African-American elder on there was clear. She says, I don't trust no white woman. And I swear you would have thought the woman cut off these women's legs, their arms and everything else at the table. They went into full fledged clutching pearls. They was, oh my goodness. I mean, they were done. Like, And I'm like, damn, the sister just said she just don't trust white women. She wasn't saying she was coming for your kids. But the visceral reaction that she got was like, oh, like there are, they are really some, they're really upset. And so she just explained why she doesn't. And she had to defend, they, she had to, def, she, they wanted her to defend why she felt that way. And she was like, well, you know, I'm gonna give you a couple of, you know, reasons, but then I'm done. And then that still wasn't good enough. But I also what I noticed was looking at the table with how white women like it was like they were searching like, OK, who can I align myself with that's going to go up against these two women right here? And then they would call on each other and say, yeah, didn't you hear her say this? And then but it didn't work. You know, they would get redirected. Um, so I remember when Regina said that I was like and I saw the reaction that it brought up experiences of me being in grad school and being, you know, when I was in grad school, I graduated in 2013. I graduated from Portland State University where most often in my classes, I had the only one syndrome. And anytime that I would bring up anything or either with race come up, it was like nine, you know, 45 eyes were on me or more. Or if I challenged a white woman on their behavior, something that they said, like label the behavior, not labeling them, big difference. I would hear this word, I'll give this, I would hear this word, I'm not feeling safe. And I would be like, for a while it didn't dawn on me, like safe. Cause when I hear it in my, when I'm hearing this, I don't feel safe. I'm like, well, is something about to happen, go down, what, you know, this, but I noticed that was a word that was used quite frequently when conversations would come up around race, equity, anything, and a white woman felt fragile. 
I don't feel safe. And then I realized, oh, that's the rallying cry. That was a, a race cold language. And that's the rallying cry for come get this angry black woman and I'm the victim. So I remember being, when I teach my classes, when I used to teach, I would put that as part of my community agreement about that word. Cause that was triggering for me. Cause I often had to be on guard and ready because when I would hear it, I, I would start seeing how white women would come together. Uh, we refer to in our community as caping. A lot of white women would be caping for one another. They couldn't be like, no, what you said was wrong. It was totally inappropriate. It would be, um, no, this woman, right? This, this, is a, a, this, is, this woman is angry and she doesn't like white folks. And I would be like, oh my, and this is in the school of social work. Okay, so I'm just giving you an example on that around how language, even in this documentary, is used to try to um, make Sayara and Regina be these angry people and these white women be victims. But when you see it play out, you were like, this is a lot of emotional manipulation. One of the rules is that they cannot cry at the table. And they really didn't like that. They couldn't, that was the second thing that made me reach out to them. When that was, that's, that's one of the main rules. White women cannot cry at the table. They didn't say you couldn't cry. They just said, you can't cry at this table. There's a room with tissue and places where you can go and chill and, you know, cry, get all your tears on out. And when you're done, come on back. Oh my goodness. You would have thought they, once again, uh, doing something horrible to, to them. Um, and then the other thing, dating and having children by black and brown men and women does not make you impervious to racism. Cause I've heard that before, you know, that I have black children or I have biracial children or I date black men or I date. And so I can't possibly be racist. And I used to tell people all the time, yeah, you can. I'm a therapist. I used to sit across with black and brown children whose mothers or fathers were black and their parent was white and nobody knew their daddy or mama was white till they showed up and they would talk to me about what it is to live in this world as a biracial person who cannot pass and they're automatically being labeled as black nobody knows that they're biracial because their hair their features and so they have to move about in this world as a black person and so I would hear that from parents all the time. Oh, I'm not racist or we're not this. And the child, the young person would be like, but you are. And you do these things and you allow our family to do these things and you don't say anything. And now here I am in therapy. So um, like Victoria said, it's a documentary. They'll, it's a great one. Um, they do talk about niceness in white women, how that is you, how that is weaponized, white women and their niceness. Um, that's what I've been dealing with a lot with this whole free book giveaway is those emails that white women perceive to be nice because they couched it between respectfully and I love the work that you do. But at the body of the email, if I don't get my book by Saturday, it's going to be a problem. Really? Ser really? It's going to be a, hmm, this is the first Black-owned business I've shot with and I, and this is what I get? Hmm, interesting. And I can go on and on about that, but um, that's what made me reach out to them because they were saying a lot of things in this book. As you can see, my little book is all, because <laughs> I went through it and I was just like, Oh my goodness, um, giving very specific examples on um, feeling entitled to every space, taking up a lot of talking over black folk and, and um, but the tears one is one that is really interesting to me. You know, the, the crying and, um, and how that's weaponized even more so now. Um, so yeah, hopefully I answered your question, Victoria. <laughs>
Thank you so much. You're that was great. And um, uh, we will continue to put the link to the uh, to, for buying tickets for that event on May 5th in chat for all who are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Brenda uh, Makota um, says, I believe that behavior of city dwellers should be at a standard that promotes civility and order. I find that conversations about this are difficult. Do you have a comment about that? Hmm. <laughs> city dwellers in particular. City dwellers. I mean, I think, you know, um, there is no easy, there is no like exact answer to give. I think just you know, having a conversation, being a, being held accountable. That's what the bookstore does. I mean, me and my husband really try to be open as much as possible to create a space in the bookstore for all people to come in and engage in conversation. And sometimes it is around very, very difficult topics. And there's sometimes people will come and say, you know what, I'm not really quite sure how to say this because I don't want you to be upset and I'm like, it's going to be my job to discern, to ask more clarifying questions if something lands on me differently. So as a somatic therapist, when I'm hearing things, I'm always like, where is this feeling at in my body? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I'm like, okay, I feel this, he I feel this heaviness in my heart. Why is that? And sometimes I've told people that, you know, wow, what you just shared with me, it's landing very heavy on my heart and this is that and the other. Um, or, you know what? I don't agree. I think we both have to be okay with, with when you hear somebody say, I don't agree with you. It doesn't mean it has to turn into a debate. It just means I don't agree and I can give my rationale as to why. But what happens is, is when I tell people, when you tell someone you don't agree with them, then they got to go into defending their position. Does that make sense? And then the whole conversation shuts down. I really, that's what we got going on. We got all kinds of people defending positions and we all are stuck. We, we're, we're just, we're on this perpetual hamster wheel. And it's like, okay, we don't agree. But what can we do? What can we agree on so we can be about the business of healing? Being better people for the planet. Because one, if we're not all better people for the planet, we don't have to worry about none of us being here. Because Gaia, Moot, in Kemet, we refer to as Moot. She's going to win. It's not a matter of if. She will and she has shown us, for me, from a spiritual standpoint, when the COVID is still around, and I'll say it again, even though white folks wanted to get back to the business of being normal, which wasn't nothing normal before COVID, period, period. But for three years sitting at home watching millions of people across the globe die, and people are still dying, and we are acting as if well, no mask, nothing else. Oh, ain't nobody dying no more. It's back to normal. It's like, if we don't talk about it, then it's not real. That's why this we struggle here. We, we're we not healing because we want to pick and choose what we want to do and who it applies to and who gets wet when there's enough for everybody to go around. We just got to be, um, yeah, we, we got a lot of work to do. Y'all are light workers. You know, you guys are light workers. People who are here willing to have the conversation are light workers. People willing to do the work and sit with some uncomfortability as well. But also hold yourself accountable. I have to hold myself accountable every day, you know. Okay. Hopefully I answer that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Brenda. So Anybody else? I'd just like to uh, let people know that um, if you want to raise your hand and you're on a laptop or a device that has the uh, information at the bottom of the screen where it says reactions, uh, there is a little hand raising and I see Carla's raised her hand. Um, because we have so many people here today, which is wonderful. We have two pages of people and I might miss you if you're not on, on this page. So 
uh, if if you're if I don't call on you, you can also put it in chat, your question in chat. But Carla, if you'd like to go ahead, that would be great. Thanks. Um, you know, I wanted to say, Michelle, how much I enjoyed two things about your presentation and follow up with a question. So one thing I really enjoyed is the examples you give are real life everyday things that happen and they're easy to identify with or, or to observe. And I think that's incredibly helpful to have. And I'm, I'm grateful for all the resources that you've given us to kind of continue our education. Um, I also wanted to say that if you haven't been to the Third Eye Bookstore, I really recommend you go. And the one resource, I mean, the books you have in there are just really wonderful, but there's a book I picked up that everyone on this particular um, conference might enjoy, and it's in your bookstore. And it's, uh, let's see if I can put it the right way. It's called uh, Diverse, um, Bibliophile Diverse Spines. And basically this book has so many categories in it that you can actually read by category that you're interested in to expand your base of knowledge. And I am addicted to this book. It's like I want to read the book before I read the book, you know? But it goes for every different purpose as well as um, how people write and they're, they're, they're categorized by the type of thing that might be in there. But the, uh, it really, truly, it has a section on legends. I hadn't heard of all the names of all the people listed in all these. And so to be able to see these, read their, their short little information and know what books they read, uh, wrote um, is really phenomenal. So um, your little bookstore is going to be a favorite haunt of mine, I think. So okay. <laughs> it was really a pleasure to go in there. Um, I think what I kind of wanted to talk about is that I've, I've, I am in the process of reading the white woman book that you've been talking about and everything you said about it struck me very it's a very poignant book to read and being open to listening is really, really important. Um, but I was wondering from you, like when you're talking about what can we do differently, it, it kind of feels like, I'm just curious as there's been so much diversive behavior in, you know, that is divisive. Let's use the word divisive, pitting people, one group, one group against another, acting like there's, zero sum game and that if you do something and I lose something, if, if somebody has to win and somebody has to lose rather than collaboration, which is what I heard thing and empathy. But I'm wondering if if it's just because I'm white or if I'm noticing it more because I'm trying to learn more, but do you find white women are talking to you about what they have learned and how they are trying to change? Because sometimes it feels we can all be lumped into one group. Mm -hmm. All white mm -hmm. women do X, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering if you're finding that there's more openness to talk about how we do that, depending on where we are in our growth. Yes, I do. You know, there are certain white women that, I, that I'm around that, you know, have spoken openly with me who won, like, I'll go back, like Sayara, who is Indian Asian. And she admitted that, she has a level of anti-Blackness and even the white women within the context of the documentary try to use that to weaponize her owning that she has a level of anti-Black and that she's continuing to do work on it. And she gave specific examples on how she made, how she's making changes, working with Regina, but also how Regina holds her accountable when she gets out of line. And like she says, when that little tiny white woman pokes his head up, Regina gets me all the way together, you know? And so I do hear that from certain white women that say, you know, you know, my, that little white woman, that Karen can pop its head up. And it's, and what I've learned, the difference is, is I can recognize it oh. because I'm doing the work and I'm like, oh, you know, that's, that's my Karen alter ego, you know, popping up and why, and doing more, here it is, doing more reflection, more reflective work. Why am I feeling like this? What's going on with me versus me projecting my insecurities and my fears back on to that woman of color that I'm dealing with? Am I making sense? So yes, I'm hearing conversations um, with women who are saying, you know what, I can, I'm, I'm, I can always do better. 
I'm always learning and I'm willing to do the work and I'm willing to lose. That's where we talk about that social capital, you know, that I hear sometimes from white women who that fear, like, and I'll give you an example of that where you can see something happening but in your split second, you have to decide, am I going to interrupt that behavior? Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I interrupt that behavior, what is it going to cost me? Now, I'm not saying people need to be out here putting themselves at risk, harms. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying if I see a friend of mine and, you know, and maybe my friend is talking or interacting with someone in a grocery store, a woman of color or whatever, and it's just inappropriate. It's just, I've seen white women, you know, I was on vacation and seen a white woman snapping at a brother in, in Jamaica, you know, to bring it. I was like, uh-uh, don't do that in front of me. Do not snap. That's a grown man. He is wow. not no child. So I'm talking wow. about when you see your friend doing something, are you willing to course correct that behavior and call attention to it and it may cost you see that's that capital what are you willing to lose uh -huh. what are you willing to lose and some white women like i have lost friends i have I, there are family members that i have to decide how much time i'm going to spend around them <laughs> or i might have to cut them off because they are dangerous to me mentally physically spiritually they right. just dangerous people, and I can't take a risk on me getting set back by being in company with them. Am I making sense? No, that makes sense. So thank you very much. Absolutely. We have plenty yeah. of time for anybody who wants to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> Jane? So first of all, thank you so much, Michelle. This is a very wonderful talk and the resources are going to be really helpful. Um, I really loved your discussion of the somatic response. When you see something that you know, maybe a white woman can't quite put their finger on it, but their heart feels it. And I really think that's a, tr a true for all of us. And you're pointing that out, just saying to me, because... Um, I think if more people could pay attention to their somatic responses in in, this, in racism and the issues that we are dealing with each other, uh, it would make a big difference. If we honor what we're feeling in our bodies, especially our, to me, my hand went my to my heart when you spoke about that. And um, I think it'd make a big, a big difference on how we all relate to each other. And, 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 um, and what you just said about what are you willing, you've got to be willing to lose that's okay. You know, why not? We, we, we must lose so that, um, so that everyone can gain. So everyone can be equal together or, you know, with equity, with each other in our emotions and all our the resources, everything. But I, I just really thought that was interesting. Maybe you have more to add about the semantic response. Absolutely. And I'll even include, in, you know, the bandwidth, you know, African people, Black folks, have built up the bandwidth. We have the we have the bandwidth. We have the racial bandwidth. We have it. We have the bandwidth of struggle. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Let me be clear. We're not, let's remove economics from it. When we talk about struggling, if there's one thing, and I'll speak, and I'm okay with speaking, having my ancestors, knowing my history, continuing to learn who I am as an African person. Um, if black folk ain't had to deal with nothing else, they've had to build up with the resilience of the bandwidth the struggle. And I just don't think enough white folks have built up that bandwidth, that tolerance. You know what I'm saying? That bandwidth. They don't. And so, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, I had one white person tell me about a month ago and we talked about this and they, they actually brought it up. They said, you know, I know I, I used to think like how do do black folks survive like how have y'all managed to deal with this to get through i don't think if we if white people went through um a, a moniker of what 
African enslaved people went through, we wouldn't make it. And I gave him the example. I said, you did. During the pandemic, there was a white man who was growing food. And when all our Hispanic brothers and sisters walked off because they couldn't get no water, why, you know, you got them out there in these fields working in 200 degree weather. And I'm being facetious with 200 degree weather, but you know what I'm talking about. And he was like, fine, I don't need you. We'll pick these potatoes. White folks got out there in them fields and was like, hell to the no. No, we can't do it. <laughs> we, and do y'all remember, I don't know if y'all heard that story where they had all those potatoes that rotted. Yeah. Cause they didn't, cause remember they, the people was, took a stand. They was like, you're not, you're not, here it is. There's a saying, I'm gonna be a friend. You're not gonna work me like I'm black and pay me like I'm Mexican. I heard that from a Hispanic brother before and I fell out because we understood where that was coming from. You're not gonna work me like I'm black and pay me like I'm Mexican. It ain't it ain't happening. So that's what happened. And then they walked off and was like, we're done. And when white folks got out there and had to pick them potatoes and get on their knees and dig in that hard dirt and work, they was like, we ain't got the band. We, we ain't got the physical makeup to deal with this. I'm not, you know, when I'm, it just, so I'm saying that the bandwidth, that's another thing to build that, like, it just, you just see it like, ooh, just, just this unsettling where we have had to, we've not historically have not had much of a choice. And I'm quite sure my elder, Miss Brenda, might be able to speak to that being an elder, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, my um, at one point, <clears throat> I realized how angry, how much anger I had in me because of needing to always compensate and be better and do things in a way that uh, would be recognized by anybody, mainly my contemporaries in uh, music and in teaching. I had to be better than, and all of a sudden I realized that the anger that I had was all manifest in my body, in my mm -hmm. shoulders, in my uh, pelvic area. And I was alarmed enough to have a real breakdown. Uh, but it it all started because I remember, or I've, finally got in touch with all this feeling in my body for what I had learned in 70 years. Mm. And so um, it's it's been very enlightening and it's been very, it has helped me find my voice because I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to sit back and and understand other people the way they treat me or I haven't got to the part where I can call people on their behavior, but I have to make sure that I do it in a way that is loving and that I, that I let them know that I love you and I, fi I find that whatever is going on right now is something that you need to know. It hurts me. Mm. So, uh, and I believe that Blacks have perse persevered because they're so used to this kind of treatment that they know I'll find a way to satisfy my soul, but I'm not. you're not going to put me down. Mm -hmm. That's my take on mm -hmm. how to behave in this world, this United States world. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Yeah, the somatic work, that's why I stopped doing traditional mental health, because um, it had an impact on my body. Uh, I held space for people for well over 10 years, a lot of traumatic stories, working with communities of color as an Afrocentric mental health uh, practitioner. So I worked with all kinds of Black, Hispanic, Asian, all, who just was like, listen, I need to talk with somebody who understands what I'm dealing with in this world here. 
you know, and I know you have an understanding of it. And I was like, absolutely. But what we process as we're processing that out in here, the body keeps the score. And so I started realizing when people are saying, like, if you're noticing, even in your own body, I don't feel connected to my body. I feel scattered. I don't feel grounded. I feel all over the place. I have people tell me this, even when I, when they come and see me for the somatic work. And so doing that somatic body work, slowing down and taking in those diaphragmatic breathing, those belly breaths really help so much. It helps ground you, but also gives you an opportunity to get try to get connected back to your body. Well, we got we have a lot of people walking around here. What we call depersonalization. They checked out, you know, and they don't feel connected. And my elders used to say, my grandma said, you got a lot of people running around here, neck down, dead. And I never used to understand the meaning of what she would say around that. You know, she would say neck down or your heart is disconnected from your head. And it's really that somatic work really can help people either rather be the Reiki or the sound bowls, just to see people's body go into a resting state where they like, because to visually see it, I'm like, whoa, the power of frequency and how it can help restore us and get us to be out in the ether, communing with your ancestors, whoever that might be you know, and being able to spend some time just out there where you can get the support that you need from the most high, whomever that might be to you, whomever that might be. So that's why I do the somatic work in addition, you know, just encouraging people while we out here dealing with the day-to-day -day operations of trying to, um, we all should be thriving versus surviving. Yeah, yeah. You know, I tell people, let that sizzle in your spirit. There's a lot of people out here thrive, uh, surviving. I even had to change my language. You know, that's something in my community. Oh, how you doing? I'm surviving. I've even had to change. No, I'm thriving. You know, speak it into existence. That we all have a right to thrive. We shouldn't get to pick who, 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 the, who survives and who thrives and we shouldn't have to do that, but we're, in, we're, you know, shoulds, you know, look at where, you know, when money is the driving factor, it don't feel good when we know people profiting from our pain and there are people profiting, making good money from us being in pain. Mm -hmm. So Donna um, has a question, I guess. Yes, ma'am. I've thought um, quite a bit about white women, why we're so terrible. <laughs> and um, I read a book that interested me a lot and it was talking about stress and the different things that human beings experience that feel stressful for us. And um, the scientists were talking about um, primates and they said in primate communities, like when they observe monkey communities and orangutan communities, um, the best position to be in is to be the mate of the alpha male, mm -hmm. to be the, the companion of the top male. So the top male is stressed and lower ranking males are stressed because they don't get as much stuff. And the top ranking male is stressed because other males are trying to compete with him. But if you are the companion of the top male, you get all the good stuff without having to compete for it. And I wonder if white women are the way we are because we are the companions of the top males in the United States. And that is what we fear. And when we have those reactions against true unity, especially with women of color, that it is our animal reaction um, that is driving it because we're afraid of losing that position of, of 
you know, being protected by white men. Like if we ally ourselves with our sisters, are we going to lose that protection of white men? And so for myself, when I'm trying to monitor my own responses and my own behaviors, I'm like, do I want to be an animal or do I want to be a human being? And I think about, you know, trying to access that higher purpose. Like I'm, I don't want to be a monkey. <laughs> I want to be a human being and I want to connect with my other human sisters. And that, and I wonder if, if, if you think there's like an, like a primitive quality to that fear that white women have and those responses that white women have. Mm. Well, you know, I, I I also, I think it's a, you know, can be a little bit primitive, but if you also look at the history of white women in this country, where white men are concerned, I mean, you, you I think you got to go way back to the plantation on that a lot of laws were created to protect white women, you know, and see, these are things, there are so many books out here that talk about white women and their participation in white body supremacy. Okay, that is that's out there. Just we didn't get told about it. <laughs> but um, I do believe it is the fear, you know, historically that white men have always tried to be in close proximity to black women, we, but in a more sexualized way. And white women have had issues around that and they have acted out historically in ways to cause a lot of harm, not only to Black women, Black children, the Black family as a whole, it just isn't talked a lot about. And so I do think that plays a part in that when I'm feeling a certain way, when a sister comes to me, a Black woman or a woman of color comes to me about a issue, white women have to pick. They have to, you're right. And it's like, man, maybe you don't recognize that little tiny ancestor in you that's poked its head up and said, hey, you're supposed to align yourself with him regardless, even if it's hurting you. Because this one, this this person right here, like I say, it's not human. You know, um, look what they're taking from you. And took your man already, even though that's not true, because black women didn't have no control over their bodies. I'm using this as a just an example, because there's so many, but this is an example that I think can resonate when we talk about going way back on that plantation and how white women were protected, but were very dangerous. Dr. Joy talks a lot about this in her book in post-traumatic slave syndrome. If you have never read, she's one of our great master teachers. She used to teach at Portland State University. She is very well known. You can look her up on YouTube, Dr. Joy DeGruy. J-O-Y. I think y'all might have had her daughter, Bahia, on here one time. I think you brought that up, Victoria. Read Dr. Joy's book. Now, it's gonna, you're going to have to let it sizzle in your spirit a little bit. But she talks about white women mm -hmm. and the laws. And I think that, like you said, that primal, like you have to make a decision in that split second. Am I going to align myself with him, even though it's causing harm to me? That goes right back to what they are talking about as well. And like, your man ain't got your best interest at heart. You might want to check again. These, you know, like I say, Roe v. Wade, really? Why you think that Roe, Roe, Roe v. Wade got overturned? We can come up with all kinds of things that make us feel good around, but genetic annihilation, Dr. Joy talks about that. There are other books that talk about genetic. We This has been talked about way before we got to this point. The fear of white folks becoming extinct you know, all of those things play a position on what white women gonna have to do. That primal, yeah. 
Am I going to line with him? Am I going to call him out on his behavior and say, I'm not tolerating this because it's causing harm, not only to me, but other bodies. It's going to call, there go that social count. It's going to cost me something. Am I willing to give it up? Am I making sense? Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, in chat a question from Sky. Um, could you please talk a little more about how white folks can be allies? Do you have some examples about how we can stand up effectively? Tell us what other white folks talking about in the room when we ain't around. I love that. Tell us that. Dr. Uh, She's the ancestor now, Dr. Frances Cress Wilson. She wrote a book called The ISIS Papers. I remember the first, is the, let me tell you something. She wrote this book in the 70s, okay? This is a very well-known book. Doctor, I remember, she's a psychiatrist. I remember the first time I read, I said, this woman is crazy. How she is psych, but see, my consciousness wasn't raised. When we See, this whole woke thing, woke is about elevating your consciousness, it has nothing to do, this is, Black folk been saying woke for, since the 1800s. This, the word woke ain't nothing new. So she, I remember she said that, tell us what other white folks is talking about when we are not around. It's going to cost you. You ain't supposed to do that. You're going against the cold. You got to ask yourself, am I willing to do that? Somebody ain't here like, I don't know about that. <laughs> and that's okay, you know, but own it. If you ask yourself that question and allies, you know, I, I'm going to tell you guys, me personally, these words like accomplice and allies, they bring, they land a little differently with me because I didn't been in places where people say they allies and they don't, they don't stand up when they supposed to come get your people. They ain't standing up because they got a risk. They're going to lose some, a job, a friend, a raise, some money, a club, what social status, all that. And so when I hear words like allies, for me personally, I, I don't trust it. Because I've been in situations where allies have not spoke up and interrupted and came and gathered they folks. And so I look around, be like, oh, you know, allies coming, no problem. I'm that one. Cause see, I'm, I'm a Leo and my mom, my mother, my parents are Garveyite. So um, we weren't quiet. Speak up. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And I, I'm clearly okay with telling people, me and my husband are very clear. We are, we are free. We are free Africans. We are not on the plantation. And I realize that we're, there are white folks who want us to be there in mind, in our body, and in our spirit. Once you are free, and we can look to the Haitian Revolution for that, once you're free, what can they do to you? That's what's scary to white folks. I really do believe. So, um, yeah, you just, um, yeah, allies, accomplice, tell us what we're talking about. You tell us what, you know, let us know what's happening. If you really, really serious about interrupting, um, dismantling all the other words that we can put out here, racism, white body supremacy, say it. Don't, don't walk up to somebody black when you see something and be like, you know, I saw, I heard, I saw, or I heard what happened. And, you know, I didn't really necessarily agree with it, you know, but in secret, do it out in the open. That's all I have to, that's one thing I can tell you, tell, be a friend, tell us, don't act like a don't know and then get surprised, <laughs> you know. So hopefully that answers your question. That's the only thing I could tell you. I think the reason I was asking the question had to do with uh, not not doing something which might make stuff worse. Yeah. Having somebody say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's, so I, I, 
I have regular conversations with white friends where there is risk involved, but I don't care uh, because my experience is, is that most of the time they don't know mm -hmm. some of the things. I, I, I talk a lot about housing with them. Mm. Most, most people don't know the history, you know, that Rosenbaum, uh, the Rosen, uh, the, the, the uh, Colored Law Book. Uh, so I, I know you know this because you probably read every book twice. <laughs> no. But I have read that one. <laughs> but most people don't, most people that I talk to don't. And I feel that I'm in a position where I can talk about it because uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, there's really less risk for me to do it. There's social risk and social capital, but I don't mind that. Uh, I've, I've always been a bit of a troublemaker anyway. So this is really good. Thank you so much for tonight, for giving your time. And, and, uh, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's, these are such important conversations. So, you know, God bless mm -hmm. you and thank you. And we do know Joy. We all know Joy really well. So we agree with you. Yes. She's a force yes. of nature. She's a force of nature. Yes. Yes. She's one, she's a great master teacher and I'm, was blessed to be a student of hers and to learn so much from her in her early days when she, when I was younger and, and watching her pursue her doctorate and defend her dissertation multiple times because they wasn't having it. But she, you know, with the with the support of the ancestors and the protection of the ancestors, you know, she, she, she got through, and she been hit. She been hitting the ground ever since. You know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. We uh, we do have um, a question uh, from Norm Peterson. Okay. We live in a society of permission givers and permission askers. It mm -hmm. feels like we are stuck here. How does that relate to this discussion? Permission. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, you know, the only thing I could say is, you know, um, in terms of, I think asking permission and then people, I guess, giving their blessing. Now, am I on the right track here? Did I say that right? Given, you know, I think I always say it's going to come back to us. I think there's certain times you're going to need, depending on the context and what's happening, to ask, um, Doctor, oh, what is Dr. Joy's full line? Joy, Joy DeGruy. Yeah, I'm putting it in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what answer to give to you. That's so, you know, I think it's going to be based on that individual asking, you know, depends on what, what, what the context is, what's happening. I don't, you know, um, I don't know. That's something I would have to think on. I'm sorry. If anybody else has any thoughts on that, you know, that's why we all here. And maybe somebody else has some feedback that they want to get. Because I, I think that's a good question. And I think we'll answer it based on our position in, in life, you know, in terms of, you know, how, because how for me as a Black person, I'm not asking nobody for shit. Sorry. If, if something don't sound right, feel right, and it's causing problems with me, I'm speaking up. I'm I'm not asking now. I'm not, you know, that I think it just depends on the situation, but I'm tired. I'm not looking to any white person or any person of color to give me permission to do anything. And I think I share, here's an example. I was in getting some pastry, getting a little breakfast and uh, I'm in a little diner restaurant across the street from a bookstore and I white woman orders some coffee and sits down I go up and order my food and sit down and come back and to make a long story short she looks across me and said I, I give you permission to sit here <laughs> really <laughs> I, you give me permission to sit here I I told Victoria I said I'm the way I looked at her I must have burned a hole in her head because I looked at her like, lady, you know, really the way I'm feeling right now, I can kind of chop you in your throat, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> I do have a sense of humor, y'all. I'm just, but I just looked at her and I did have to tell her, you know, um, 
you know, I, I'm not, I told her this was, I said, I'm not on no plantation. I don't have to ask you permission to sit anywhere. I sit where I want to sit and I go where I want to go. So I'm at a point now where I guess it just depends on the context and what's happening. If I'm going to ask you permission on something or not. I'm, so it might be different for other people. Anybody else got any thoughts on that? What you think? Because I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts too. <laughs> Um, Norm, do you, is is this a follow up to your question, or can I call on Randy first? I'm not sure. <laughs> You're <laughs> muted. Okay. Well, Randy, go ahead. <laughs> um. So, Ms. Lewis, I'm going to call you out because I heard you ask permission from Ms. Brenda mm -hmm. if you if you could speak. Yes. And I thought it was a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my, and I, I know that's not what you you were talking about. So I'm giving you yes. a hard time, but, but, yes. um, but I, I, I believe that the idea of doing things uh, to be respectful of someone, you know, that that's your motive, that's mm -hmm. a kind thing to do. And I think that that's, you know, when people have de deserve that, but that's your choice, you know, you made that mm -hmm. choice. Um and so I, I, I think it really is like what you were saying, you know, it's, it's, it's who you are and, and where you, where you stand. If, if you've been, uh, if people have been demanding respect from you, that's a little different. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. a superiority attitude that I'm going to put you in your place. And it feels to me like that's what you were saying, at least from my perspective, yeah. that's what I heard. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I think that idea of, doing things for out of the out of a motive of being kind and being respectful and being um you know asking permission in that way it's different than well like what this woman did to you in the in the coffee shop if that's what mm -hmm. you're, where it was you know that that that's a a whole different thing so i think it really comes down to motive and yeah. where where somebody's heart's at and uh, i think that we need a little bit more um respect for others and asking permission from a from a position of humbleness you know being humble towards someone else who who deserves respect but um but the unfortunate thing of course with black and whites is that whites have have this inherent sense of superiority and therefore there's an expectation of you got to ask my permission mm -hmm. you know um to, to, to walk around in the world. But, um, so yeah, I, I feel like that's a, it's sort of a loaded question in a lot of ways, isn't it? But to mm -hmm. me, it's a chance for me to check my attitude and my, and my, um, yeah, my privilege and all of those things. It's a, it's a, it's a good, it's an interesting question, Norm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, I, that's why I wanted to hear from other people and, um, you know, to thank you for bringing that up, Randy. You know, if anybody, yeah, me asking permission to speak, you know, um, from an elder, how I was raised, you know, that is what you do from an elder. Um, and before you forget any ceremony, African way, any ceremony, you ask, the elders give you permission, you know, just like when I was raised, you don't sit down in nobody's house. You stand at that door until they tell you, offer you a place to sit. And so um, me, whenever I try to, whenever I do things, I try to make sure I find an elder in the room and um, and say, hey, you know, I'm seeking that from you, you know, out, and also out of respect um, that there are people on this call who are, who, who are very seasoned um, and who have lived a very different life that can teach me things. And so that was my way of saying, Miss Brenda, holla at me. <laughs> Let me know if I can. <laughs> you know, so I appreciated that, Randy. You know that um, that somebody else probably might have been. She has permission to speak, but so we're we're getting close to um, our closing time, and we have two more people that want mm -hmm. that have questions and or comments. So, uh, Norm, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm, I'm the person who asked the question about permission. Yeah. And uh, I just have just, in my mind recently, kind of boiled the whole thing down about, you know, 
had people being forced to ask permission for everything they do. And I think that's at the heart of the Black experience. It has to be infuriating that you have to, you know, even in a subtle way, ask permission, or you don't do something because you might not be permission. You know, in Seattle, people weren't allowed to go north of the ship canal without permission. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. So I think we're stuck that way until we can change the society from a permission required society top down to something where we all work together and don't even, you know, we can ask permission with uh, out of respect and stuff. That's that's wonderful, you know. But it's not set up that way. It's mm -hmm. you know the top guys. You got to get their permission. Every even for buying stuff and going places. I mean, everybody's subject to, to this except with the black people. It's just a thousand times more. And I just. I'm in awe that the black community has uh, even withstood this, you know, with the grace that they have over this over this time, you know. Yeah. So. Thanks, Norm. That's Thank great. you, Norm. Uh, Denise, would you like to find finish us out tonight? Yes, I would. So um, I got on a little bit late because I was still working. And I also wanted to respond to the permissions that it for a, a, a black person that's mixed with a whole lot of things. Um, it feels like I've always had to it's it's the permissions are hidden in plain sight where me I can see as an African American, as a black person, that's what that is what has been dealt to me. Even being, you know, a little girl born and raised here in in Oregon and Portland, and a nurse in Mississippi telling me that I couldn't drink out of a water fountain, nor could I come on this side of the hospital, but I drank out of the the water fountain anyway. And she came up to me and said, you kids must be from the North. And I said, well, we are from Portland, Oregon, but my little sister wanted water. So I told her to drink all the water she wanted because I didn't feel that I should ask for permission to drink out of that water fountain, that I should just go and drink out of the water fountain. And um, my aunt was telling my mom to whip me. My mom said, no, I'm not going to whip Denise, but I can bring that forward to today, even where I work in my business. And when it comes to the, the, the black and white thing and how um, there are white women that work on my job that could certainly be an ally, but they choose not to be an ally. So I receive uh, uh, just, you know, racist behavior of things every day. And I'm like you, Michelle, I speak up, I speak out. And in my entire lifetime, yes, it has cost me jobs, but there's always been something better for me going through and coming through another door. And I know we don't have time to go through my whole journey, but going just to the Portland public schools, getting slapped by the kindergarten teacher, getting hit in the head just because I want to get an education at Jackson High School in Tigard, Oregon, that left a permanent mark on my forehead. But I'm just saying, I still keep, you know, persevering because that's what we do as Blacks and African American people. And I understand the um, the the respect thing for your elders that Michelle did for Brenda. I love that. That's a cultural thing for us. And I certainly believe in that. It is something that I really believe that our culture has lost. And especially our kids in school, K through 12, um, have just it's a it's just a lost thing that. They, that people will walk around and just disrespecting people, shooting people, killing people just because of the color of your skin. And so I could just give many instances and many stories of things that I'm just going through even right now on my job, just trying to survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be in there just trying to 
um, survive. I want to, I want to thrive like everyone else. I don't feel that I need to go home, beat up on my family or the dog just because you don't like me because of the color of my skin or the color of my, or the texture of my hair or whatever. I just, you know, want to, to want to be. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be labor the time, but I could, you know, just talk about a lot of instances. So I just gave you a little bit of, of various little things that I, as an individual, just go through on a daily basis while being black, shopping in the store, getting followed every time I go to the store. Like sister said, go to the bank, being denied of wanting to get a, a home loan or a mortgage or whatever. So it's driving while black, getting stopped on the way to work, trying to mind my business, driving the speed. Why, why did you stop me, officer? So it's just many things that we as people have to go through every single day. And I'm saying, where are the allies that can interrupt the behavior and can interrupt it when you see it? And so a lot of times I, I do interrupt it no matter the cost. And if they say you're fired because you spoke up on behalf of this person treating um, these individuals in a different manner, my attitude is then so be it. So, and then I appreciate everyone's comments and thank you, Michelle, for, for putting on this presentation. When I saw it, I was like, oh, I, I just, I need to be here just to get some relief in this space. Thank you, Miss Denise. I don't know if you remember me, but <laughs> um, you look so you do look familiar. Um, and you know, I work at I work at the college, and mm -hmm. and you probably know where I go to, to the different various services and the things that I do in the community. Well, I know your daughter, and I know Serena. I'll just put it there. Okay, thank you so very, very much. <laughs> I do remember you now. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, Michelle, this has been so amazing. Thank you oh. so much for being our speaker. Oh, absolutely. Thank y'all for having me, you know, and I, I appreciate it. it was a wonderful discussion and we'll all just keep, you know, doing the work and, um, you know, like I say being better people for, you know, for our community, better people for the planet. I should say, you know, as a second woman practitioner, being, you know, that's my our main goal, being healers for the planet, the community, and our families, you know, and, um, you know, that's what, that's, that's the mission. Mm -hmm. But it's a blessing to be on this night, um, you know, with y'all and share, and sharing Zoom space with each and every one of you. And I don't like to say goodbye. I always say Shim Hotep which is um, this in the Medjinetzer is this go in peace. Mm -hmm. Jim Hotep. Jim Hotep. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Sky, you can stop the recording.